welcome to the Make Life Fun Show. I'm your host, Josie Wheatman, and I am so excited that you're here. I have graduated the mom game. I have been in it now for almost a year. Can you believe it? Everett is walking. Wow, it's a whole new game. Through the last 25 episodes, I have learned so much and I have grown in my craft. I have grown as a mom. And the biggest thing I've learned is just love, 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 taking it in, giving it out, love, and being in the present moment with my son and continuously just giving him my regulated self as often as I can. And that is what's changing the game in motherhood. That is what's breaking my generation of parenting. If you are new to listening, you are in for a treat. Welcome back, mamas, to the Make Life Fun podcast. I am so excited to have you with us today. I have a treat for you. Today, we have Karen Ashley on the podcast, and she is going to be talking to us about healthcare, about empowering ourselves in healthcare, which I think is such an important topic. So, Karen, thank you for being here. I'm so excited to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yes, please tell us a little bit about yourself. So, I am a wife, I am a mom, I am pregnant with my sixth child. It's my fifth biological child. I've adopted one from India and it's actually the anniversary of him coming home this week. So that is really exciting for us too. My background is in healthcare. I started off after college starting as a nurse. So I have a bachelor of science in nursing and I started working at a pediatric hospital at that time. And then I went right into grad school. So I knew I wanted to do something different then work in a hospital, which I still ended up working in the hospital for a long time. And I loved it. And I gained a lot more from that than I thought I would, but I ended up going to grad school and I got a master's degree in women's health. And so I was a nurse practitioner and I practice only with women. So my, de- my degree has me with women of childbearing age. So any, anywhere from onset of puberty until end of life, basically for women. So mostly my interest is in the reproductive years. So childbearing, you know, pre-pregnancy, pregnancy, postpartum, but anytime along that lifespan, supporting women in general (laughs) in healthcare or not is a huge passion of mine. I just, I just love it. So I love educating. I love empowering. I just felt through my whole journey as becoming a mother and then having more, more and more children, the more I have, I've just had a lot of experiences through motherhood and with healthcare that really empowered me in making my own decisions for myself and making decisions for my children. Yes. And I think that making decisions for yourself and your children is so huge, but I want to go back a little bit to before we started this conversation, you were speaking of like you have six and I said to you that I have one and you said something that touched my heart that I think will also touch the heart of our listeners. Yeah. So I would love for you to also repeat that because you said you had six and I'm like, I only have one. <laughs> yes, it, yes. yes. Okay. So I will say this wisdom did not come from me, but from mm-hmm. another mama of seven. And she said, you know, cause people say that a lot, you know, you say, Oh, do you have kids? And how many? Yes. I'm pregnant with my sixth. And then immediately they have the same reaction. Oh my goodness. How could you? do that? How is that possible? I'm just, I'm struggling with one or I'm drowning with one or Mm -hmm. it just feel like, you know, I'm doing okay with one, but it feels like a lot. And so she says to everybody, no matter how many you have, they fill up your life. Mm -hmm. So you have one child, they take every ounce of love and attention and that you have. And the same happens. The more children you add, they, no matter how many you have, they fill it up. So I have the same stresses now that I did then. And they're more in number, I guess, but I don't feel more stressed than I did back then. I have the same same amount (laughs) because you grow and change and you begin to figure out what do I need to be worrying about? What's not something I need to worry about anymore. And where, where do I need to let that stress happen? Yes. (laughs) Oh my gosh. That word of wisdom, like let it wash over (laughs) you, mama. (laughs) Be encouraged because it definitely gave me a little push of encouragement with that conversation. So yes. women in couples right now that are in, that are trying to advocate for themselves with their health care, mm-hmm. what is three things that if they knew these three things or even two, they knew these, it would like set them up for success as they start going into advocating for themselves and their child. 
Oh, I have six, seven, (laughs) (laughs) eight. Well, um, having been a patient and having been a provider and having gone through, you know, clinical training as a nurse practitioner and watching other practitioners interact with their patients, I have learned a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think I probably learned more as a patient than as a provider in how to interact with people. But I experienced things with my children and with myself where you walk into a healthcare facility. It could be a clinic, could be an urgent care, could be a hospital, could be a birth. You know, you walk in and you have questions and concerns. And when they're about your children, I feel like it's even a higher sense of anxiety. You know, you walk in with concerns, you go in there scared and you maybe go in there and they listen to you. Maybe they don't listen to you. Maybe you have 10 questions and you only feel like you have time to ask one or two. Maybe some of those questions get dismissed or they say, oh, don't worry about that. Or that's probably nothing. And then you walk out maybe with a plan that you aren't fully on board with or that you don't understand or they just, you just don't feel confident about. And that's happened to me so many times. One time my son had some pretty alarming symptoms and I looked it up online and I do not discourage my patients from getting on Google. Like I, (laughs) you know, some people are really threatened by that. Don't go, don't Google that. Don't Google that. And there is a lot of information out there on the internet. It is a scary place to go. So not saying like stay away from it completely or trust in it completely, but I did, I went on Google and I looked up his symptoms. And as you know, someone with a master's degree, I felt like, you know, I'm Googling his symptoms and I found what I thought he had. And I took him to the doctor and the doctor said, he looks fine. Stay off the internet. Mm. And he didn't know that I was a medical professional, but that to me, I was scared. And I went in there with really valid concerns with very valid symptoms and was completely dismissed and told to stay off the internet. Like don't research this. Mm -hmm. just, and he didn't even examine him. And I thought I was going to (laughs) cry, you know, that's just horrible, you know, to feel like you are very concerned for your child and someone just dismisses you and says, Mm -hmm. it's not a problem. Turns out it was a problem. And I had to go find a doctor that would listen to me. And so situations like that, big and small have happened several times. And I've watched other practitioners do that to other people as I'm in clinical. And I just, it breaks my heart because I don't want any woman to ever feel that way. I don't want any mom to feel that way. It's, there's enough anxiety in child care in general, let alone throwing in a health issue in there. So my number one piece of advice would be to find a provider that you trust. Mm -hmm. So it's not easy. There's often limited options because of insurance coverage or geographic location. There's just not a lot of options around, but it truly makes all the difference to go to someone that you know will listen to you, that you know will hear you, and that can give you a plan that you trust. Because if you are given a plan that you don't trust, you're either not going to do it Mm -hmm. or you're going to do it with a bunch of worries and anxieties hanging over your head the whole time. And that's not helpful. (laughs) A lot of providers, when you go to someone who's like a primary care provider, like your pediatrician or family practice doctor, or some people use their OBGYN as their primary care. A lot of times those people that you have long-term relationships with will do a kind of a meet and greet appointment that doesn't that there isn't a charge for. Mm -hmm. So you can sort of hop around and word of mouth is probably the best way to find these people. Just talking to other moms that you know, that you trust to see what their experiences have been with those providers and to call their office and say, I'm looking for a new provider. I'm not here for a full medical checkup today, but I have questions that I would like to ask about your office, about your philosophies, about your, you know, and just to get a basic feel from them of, is this relationship going to work out? Is this a person that I feel I can trust? Mm -hmm. You know, because there's some people you just don't get that. I mean, it's immediate, you know, you can, I just am not feeling this. (laughs) I'm not feeling, yeah, yeah, it's a vibe. (laughs) I don't feel comfortable talking to you, you know, and there is kind of a warm up time, but there's just some people where you meet them and you talk to them and you think, yes, this person 
understands me and is listening to me and I feel confident they're going to involve me in the care and give me plans I can trust. So there are those appointments that you can do. And I, pediatricians, I know, do them all the time. And I think OBs do them too. I've done that before where I just, I, it's basically like an interview, <laughs> ask your questions. And then if you feel like this is a good match, go forward. If you're just not going to mesh with this person, I wouldn't do it. I mean, I would keep looking. That doesn't work for acute situations. You know, you go into the hospital or an urgent care, you kind of get who you get, but there are other options there too. You can, you can say, I really like to speak to a different provider and you can say it in a kind, polite way. You don't have to be rude about it. You know, it doesn't, you won't come off. Maybe they'll think you're quote unquote difficult, but you don't have to think that you're difficult. You're not taking up space. You're not inconveniencing people by saying, I don't feel like you're listening to me or I don't feel, I don't feel heard. And I want to speak to somebody else. There's other options usually. So my first piece of advice would be to find a provider that you feel comfortable with and trust. The second one would be to make sure you write your questions down ahead of time and that you leave space on your paper to write down your answers. Even I do this as a person who's been in healthcare for more than 10 years. I still write my questions down because I know I'll forget. You get in the room and they, you know, you start talking, they start talking, they start telling you what the plan is going forward and you haven't even figured out, you haven't even finished your questions yet, but you can say, oh, I still have more questions or like, you know, if they're kind of like scooting towards the door, you can say, I'm not done yet. <laughs> I still have a few more questions for you before appointments too. If it's like a long standing issue, write down the observations that you've had about that issue with your kids or for yourself. Timelines are super helpful for providers to see how long an issue has been going on, how it's changed. And then observations, big and small. I love it when people come to me with wacky observations and they say, you know what? I think this situation had an impact here. You know, I, I think this started in this, no matter how crazy it sounds, you know, like, I think it started when this specific event happened or this stressful life event happened. And, you know, sometimes providers will dismiss that and say, that's not relevant. I love it because Women are intuitive, incredibly intuitive, and they are observant. If they feel that something is connected, it probably is. <laughs> so I tell people, don't be apologetic about bringing up things that even sound a little crazy. Maybe they aren't related, but we write it down and we think about it. We talk about it. So writing down the answers to all those questions is helpful. There have been studies on how much people retain in a visit to the doctor. So, and it's about 10% of what they hear. And that's including people who have medical backgrounds. I've gone into appointments, come out and said, oh, what the, you know, talk to my husband, what did the, doc the doctor say? You know, I don't really remember. <laughs> it was a lot. Mm -hmm. And they do sometimes speak in a different language. <laughs> yes. Not, you know, it's English, but it's medical jargon or it's just words that you're not familiar with. So I write my answers down and I will repeat back to the provider. This is what I heard just to make sure that I have it right. And you can say that, you know, like, am I hearing you correctly? Or are you saying that you think it's related to this mm. or whatever? So those are my first three. Yes, <laughs> those are from. so <laughs> wonderful. Because as you were speaking, I was literally nodding my head for those that can't see me because it's so true. You go in there and you are thinking, you're thinking these thoughts and you're trying to express, but they're just like, nope. I got something to say. Yeah. <laughs> and so you given us this encouragement of like, no, stand up for yourself and be empowered to ask mm -hmm. those questions, to get the answers you need and not yes. to be pushed off, especially from a medical provider. It's so encouraging. So yes. thank you for those three tips so yes. very much. And what got you interested in this field? Cause you were talking about the intuition piece for women, which I think is huge and you having six kids you being on both sides <laughs> what got you so interested in this field of working with mamas and postpartum and have you noticed too while working in this field with women that there is for postpartum there is something that women can take away from something that you've experienced yourself especially having the six kids yeah oh <laughs> absolutely I thought going into coming from, and I worked originally in a children's hospital. Mm -hmm. And so, and I wasn't married yet. I didn't have any children yet. I thought, you know, after a couple of years in there, I'm like, oh, I'm getting pretty good at this. You know, I'm understanding this and I can take care of these kids and I don't need to be a mom to be able to care mm -hmm. for these kids in, in a hospital setting. 
but then everything changed when I had children mm. in my own home and when I was birthing children, it was completely different and changed my perspective on interacting with those moms mm. in the hospital. And I think what really got me interested in kind of focusing on this childbearing period mm -hmm. was all the gaps that I saw when I went through the whole system saying like, this is not right. This is not right. Mm -hmm. I really struggled here. I really struggled here. These things are what helped me. And I, looking back on those things, don't want any mom to have mm -hmm. to go through that alone. It just makes me so sad to see women who are struggling with isolation or being alone or being, you know, taken advantage of by the system or just not heard. It just, I know how it made me feel and I don't want anyone to have to feel that way. <laughs> so, and this applies, like I said, to the clinic, the hospital, the labor and delivery, your postpartum visits, your pediatrician. There's just so many ways that women's voices are lost in that. And so I think going through that and seeing where the gaps were, was really helpful for me to have direction going forward. Mm -hmm. And I was also able to see when that system was functioning optimally, mm -hmm. how much better I felt. Yes. So through my first birth, I was in a hospital and I'm not going to hospital bash or doctor bash. My <laughs> husband's a doctor. I'm not going <laughs> to like totally bash. It's more of a systemic issue. It's not an individual issue because there are wonderful, amazing doctors that don't act the way I described earlier. Mm -hmm. There are wonderful, amazing facilities that don't function in that way. But overwhelmingly, I would say that the situations I described earlier are the main way mm. that offices, the, the whole system functions. So my first birth, I was told everything that was going to happen to me. I was not asked. Mm. I was not involved in my treatment. So the doctor called me and said, you know, your labs are a little concerning. You need to come to the hospital now and we are going to induce you. And then I got there and they said, we are going to put this in. You know, we're going to do this IV. We are going to do a pelvic exam, open your knees and put your feet together. You know, they never asked me that is a violation <laughs> of your body. That's a violation of your autonomy. So there are ways to go about that situation that don't make you feel like you are just a person on the assembly line, that you have this problem, you require this solution, and we're going to do it to you without asking for your permission. Mm -hmm. So that was scary for me. And it was really the opposite of empowering. I felt mm -hmm. powerless to the whole thing. And then when I look back on that situation, after some time of reflection, I could see I did have a choice in a lot of those things. It just was not provided to me. Mm -hmm. With this, my second birth, I said, that's not going to happen again. We're, we're going a completely different direction. And I believe that you can have a really empowering, beautiful birth in a hospital. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But it is going to require a lot of advocacy on your part or on the part of your partner or whoever your support people are to really help you advocate for yourself for that just because of the way the systems are in place. Mm -hmm. So my second baby, I had a midwife. I was at home. And she made all the difference for me. You know, she was so empowering. She said, I'm not delivering your baby. You are. Mm. And she asked me, can we talk about your health history? Do you mind discussing this aspect of your health? And then, you know, anytime she did any kind of exam, whether it was only just touching my belly or measuring my belly or doing the Doppler, and she would say, she, it was just a, a completely different way of asking. I think it's important that we check the baby's heart rate today. Are you okay with mm -hmm. me doing that with my Doppler? Or would you prefer that I did it with a fetoscope? Or I think it's important that we do this today for this reason. Would you like to do that? And pelvic exams, instead of saying, you know, scoot down, put your legs up. <laughs> it was, I think it's important to do this pelvic exam for A, B, and C reason. Are you okay with that? Mm -hmm. And do you mind if I start now? as you move forward. And that is respectful. Yes. <laughs> that is empowering to a woman. And it's to anyone, especially someone who has been through abuse or been through trauma mm -hmm. to have someone who is seemingly in a place of authority, tell you, I'm doing this to your body. I'm going to perform this procedure or give you this medication or do this intervention to someone who has had their body or their autonomy violated in the past, that's incredibly re-traumatic. <laughs> so we can't do that to anybody. 
Oh my gosh, as you're speaking, I can't stop nodding my head because it is so true. I am just like, there's such a different contrast with what you're saying of like, I'm going to do this to you versus can I, may I, like Mm -hmm. you get to have an input. It is so true. And it's so much more empowering when we feel like we have a choice and we feel like we have a say, but even when we're not giving that say, what I'm hearing you say is stand up for yourself and claim it and claim that power. Mm -hmm. And I feel like when we go into the medical field, when we go into a hospital or clinic, we kind of almost give away our power because we think that person is the specialist and they have all the control. And how can we even start to take a little bit of that power back? Because we don't even know what's happening. I don't think. Right. Yes. No, it's, it's absolutely a systemic and long-term thing. So we are taught as children and in our culture that medical people are authorities, Mm -hmm. they're authority figures, and they are experts. So they know better than we do. We must do what they say, Mm -hmm. because they know better. Mm -hmm. And we should follow their instructions. And we should not that if we oppose that in any way, even just to ask questions, Mm -hmm. that we are ignorant, Mm -hmm. that we are difficult, that we're obstinate, that we are trying to create a problem. Mm-hmm. You know, that was a, a word in, in the medical field was problem patient. Mm-hmm. It's a problem patient. And I hate that because I don't say hate a lot, but those people are not problems. Mm-hmm. They are speaking up for themselves. <laughs> and so when we see these, even nurses, doctors, even, you know, anybody in the healthcare field, we see them as an authority. And that if we are going against what they say, we must, you know, uneducated or trying to be a problem when we're not the only authority over your body is yourself. Yes. <laughs> I mean, there are legal things you cannot do with your body. You cannot go steal with it. You can't go murder with it. You know, like there are rules, but regarding decisions about your health care, those are yours. You are the authority over those and for your children. So it's just a cultural thing, I think. But as we learn that you are the authority over your body, you get to make the decisions that will help you when you walk into those situations and say, you know what, this is my responsibility. This child is my responsibility. Because when you enter a situation where you're going to have a procedure or you uh, medications, these things have risks. So you enter any situation with risk, there has to be a choice. So those people are there to provide you with informed consent and informed consent means being provided the risks the benefits and the alternatives. Sometimes the risks and benefits are discussed. Often the alternatives are not, but sometimes they are. But at the end of the day, you're the one accepting the risk Mm -hmm. or accepting the benefit. So, you know, there's a new medication. They say you could take this and it might help you. So if the medication has side effects or adverse reactions, that doctor is not at home with you experiencing Mm -hmm. those, you know, that doctor is not at home rocking your child who's, you know, screaming in pain or or having a reaction all night or bad rash, whatever, you know, reaction it is, they're not with you. Mm -hmm. That's, that was your risk to take on. And if you have understood the risks thoroughly, you have understood the benefits thoroughly, you have understood what your alternatives were thoroughly, you will feel confident in that decision. If adverse event does happen or side effect does happen and you were aware of it, and you weighed that with the benefits, you are going to feel confident that night holding that baby that's Mm. going through a reaction or whatever, whatever it was, knowing I knew this was going to happen. I am accepting this because I know that it's going to be a benefit. Mm. And you feel confident in that moment, instead of feeling completely powerless, instead of feeling like someone else made this decision for you, it's empowering is what it is, (laughs) but it, it gives you confidence in your decision too, that you did what was right because you had all of the information you needed in order to make that decision. Oh my gosh. So true. One of the most empowering thing that I was told going through my own journey like this was that, you know, your body better than this doctor, like, you know, your body. Yes. So I say that all the time and it's about everything in life. I say it a lot about education as well. Okay. No person on this earth loves you more than you do. Nobody on this earth loves your children, except maybe your partner, (laughs) more than you do. Nobody knows you better than you do. Nobody knows your children better than you do. You know them the best and love them the most. And so you are the most capable person to make 
those decisions. You can absolutely take in wisdom and advice from all those experts. And in medicine, in healthcare, you know, a lot of those experts are medical people. They can come from other people around you too that are just thoughtful and that care about you. And you can say, I'm having a hard time with this decision. I know my body best. I know my child's the best and I love them the most, but there still seems to be a question here on what should I do? What's the right Mm -hmm. path? I've gathered the information from the experts. I still don't know what to do. You can talk to those people that you trust in your life that also care about you to help you make those decisions as well. So another, my list from earlier (laughs) that I was adding on to is finding it those people in your life that are advocates for you Mm -hmm. that can, that you can go to with these hard questions sometimes and say, what do you think? Or like, can you help me think this out and bring those people to your appointments? Mm -hmm. The people who are really quiet and timid around authority, you know, it's it's hard for those people to speak up in appointments, bring your sassy friend, Mm -hmm. like the sassiest friend you have, you know, the one that's outspoken, that's not going to let anyone walk all over you. And you can, you know, the quiet, you know, timid friend is like, oh, no, that's all my questions. And she can say, those were not all your questions. You wanted to know about this and you had questions about that. And COVID really put a damper on that advocacy in the hospital and in clinics because they weren't allowing other people in. And it really had a bad effect on people's care because they didn't have people there to advocate for them. Don't always feeling your greatest in those moments, you know, like Mm -hmm. if you're sick, your kids are sick, you're stressed out. You are not thinking straight. You also not thinking straight when you're in the middle of birthing a child, you know, like there's just decisions that need to be made that are hard to do on your own. And so if you have people around you that can say, I know what she wanted, what are our choices here? And then it can help you think through those things and people with people you trust. So that's another huge way to get what you need from the mm-hmm. system is to have people with you that will help you advocate. That is a change maker. It was a change maker mm-hmm. for me. I noticed that when my husband wasn't in the room, it was completely a different vibe than when he was there watching over me. It was so mm-hmm. it kind of, it's kind of mind blowing now looking back at it, how mm-hmm. different it is having somebody there on your side who right. is it all drugged up and medicated. <laughs> right. And just like, just, you're just not in your thinking brain. <laughs> you are in a very focused mode. You've got your blinders on. It's just hard to think outside of your situation when your body is going through such an intense moment yeah. like that physically and emotionally. Yes. So true. Absolutely. So true. And I know that the postpartum care, that one is one of the big hot topic with how much care we get here in the Western world versus how much care we get that other people get in other cultures where it is almost mm-hmm. part of the it's part of the pregnancy, that postpartum yes. care. We're here, yes. it kind of feels like almost dropped off. Yes. And so I would love yes. for you to speak on that. Oh my gosh, bit. we can have a whole other show on postpartum. <laughs> <laughs> I have soapboxes on that. But I do, it's exactly like you said, I feel like we are dumped out of the hospital or wherever you have chosen to birth. And you come back six weeks later and it's like, you have just had the most, sometimes, most of the time, the most transformative experience mm-hmm. of your life emotionally, physically, mentally, this is a big thing. And I always say when a new baby is born, a new mother is born. Mm -hmm. And that happens with every single child. You are a new person. Every time a new baby comes, you're a new mom. You are a different mom than you were the last time. And there is a doula who speaks on this a lot. And she, her business is called newborn mothers because there is a new mom is born every single time. And so you're absolutely right. This country, it's our culture to just drop the moms off. And then we maybe bring them a meal or something. And then we check on them six weeks later, you go to a visit, they make sure that you're all healed up. They talk to you about birth control and then send you on your way. Mm -hmm. And it's a huge disservice to women. And it's not the way other cultures have done this Mm -hmm. for since people started having babies. (laughs) There's a great book called the first 40 days that talks about different cultures and their traditions after birth. Mm -hmm. And I started reading that, I think probably after my third child. And I was, I am moving to Sierra Leone because in Sierra Leone, they talk about, they rub their mamas down with shea butter and they feed them. And like, they don't let them get out of their bed. And they say like, we're going to fatten you up. (laughs) (laughs) You, and that it's same in China. You like literally are not allowed to leave your bed for Mm -hmm. like two weeks. And they keep you warm and bring you all these like special soups and Mm -hmm. nourishing things. They all have nourishing meals. They all have nourishing practices and they just love on their mamas. 
And it is not the case here. I just feel like that is when I think of those things, I think that is so like warm and Mm -hmm. like connecting. And then I think of what happens here and it just feels cold and isolating. And so I love postpartum doulas. Mm -hmm. If you can somehow wiggle your budget in such a way (laughs) or find a friend that is this way to get yourself a postpartum doula, they are amazing. I believe it's what you know, an auntie would do, you know, in another country that they would just, they just come over the aunts and moms and grandmas, they come over and they love on the mom. And we just, our society here, you know, families are scattered. You're not having babies next to your family all the time. And so you just don't have those people to come in and love you and take care Mm -hmm. of you. So if you don't have those people, postpartum doulas are amazing. They come into your house and they cook you food and they take care of your kids and they do light housework they're worth their weight in gold. (laughs) Yes. and Yes. (laughs) Yes. But also to know that that is what the normal practice is for humankind (laughs) to love and care on their moms. And to know that you may not get that here or that that's not the culture here. You might need to ask for it. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. That you are not being selfish. You are not being needy. You're not it's not because you can't do it because of course you can. I mean, you can take care of your baby on your own, but you shouldn't have to, you know, you shouldn't need to. And it's not normal. That's not how cultures have existed for thousands of years. You aren't meant to do this alone. You are meant to be supported and it's okay to ask for that. And you're not being needy by asking for it. Yes. Oh Cause it's my what's gosh. needed. You will do better. Your baby will do better. And Also, your baby will do better because you are doing better, (laughs) you know, because you are fed, you are nourished, you need nourishment to feed the baby, you need nourishment to recover from that huge physiologic event, and you need support, and you need more medical follow up, or I mean, not necessarily medical, but more midwifery, or woman, uh, some kind of woman provider follow up to look for things like and, or to ask questions about infections and pain and bleeding. And you can call your doctor's office about those things and you can try to get to them through their nurse and the nurse call you back and they have an answer that you don't love, <laughs> you know, that doesn't, you don't feel comfortable with. And then you have to go back and ask the doctor again. And it's, you feel like you're needy because you're having to push really hard to get what you need, but you're not being needy. You're just advocating for yourself and you should absolutely do that. Cause that's what they're there for. Yes. So oh, be so encouraged. This is such good information <laughs> for the moms, to, for us to all hear that we get to create the birth that we want. We get to create yes. the postpartum <clears throat> that we want. And even if there is a normal quote, normal, <laughs> we get to yes. say, we get to decide and know that there is a better way. And it's up to us to make that decision and decide right. to, like you said, stand up for ourselves and ask for what we need, mm-hmm. which is huge. Right. Which is huge. Absolutely. And it, it will be better for your entire family unit for you to do that. And if you feel like you're at the point where like, I can't ask for that anymore. I'm having trouble advocating for myself. I'm just tired. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm physically and emotionally exhausted. Those are things you can talk about beforehand with your support people, your partner or your whoever, your parent, you know, whoever's your most supportive person around your birthing experience. You can say beforehand, I would really like you to check in on my mental health Mm -hmm. afterwards, after the baby's born, you know, like I might not be able to think of it. I might not want to call anybody or talk to anybody about it, but please check in with me and Mm -hmm. ask me how I'm doing. And if I'm struggling I want you to help me like get the care that I need. Mm -hmm. And you can say those sort of things ahead of time or in the moment, say, I don't have the capacity to do whatever I feel like needs to be done. Will you help me? Or like, it feels hard. And we feel like people should know that people should just go do it. (laughs) It should happen. But the sad reality is that it just doesn't always. So, and those people that in our lives that are supporting us, they want to know how they can help us, you know, like sometimes dads, I feel a little left out. They might feel a little left out because they just don't know what to do. You know, no one told them (laughs) they haven't always, you know, culturally been in this role, but they want to help. They want to be useful. And so they might not always think of all the things that you need. And sometimes we can just get some bitterness built up. He should know that he needs to cook dinner tonight, or he should know that I need, you know, a break from the baby when he gets home from work or whatever it is. We think that they should know that and they don't. (laughs) 
always <laughs> think of those things. But I think, you know, if we say in a nice way, you know, like, you know, I'm really burned out by five o'clock. And if you come home, if you could take the baby for, you know, half an hour or whatever, I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to lay around and watch Netflix, but I need you to hold the baby or whatever it is. They want to do that most of the time, you know, like they want to help. And it was really empowering for my husband, the second birth that we had where the midwife taught him mm -hmm. and said, this is what you can do in labor. This is what you can do after to support her. And that was so helpful for him because the first time he felt lost, he just kind of sat on that weird hospital couch and was like, what do I do? <laughs> Why am I here? And afterwards he just, now he knows what to do because somebody mm -hmm. told him and he really appreciated that. So really leaning on those people and making sure that they have the tools that they need to support you mm -hmm. is really helpful in a postpartum period. Oh my gosh. So you help women advocate for themselves. And is that the work that you are currently doing with so the work I'm currently in right yeah. now, because I have so many children, <laughs> I'm in the baby phase of life still, even though I have a 10 year old. So after my traditional schooling, I went on to get more training in integrative and functional medicine. And what that means is integrating other modalities into the conventional model. So the conventional model is, you know, where your doctor went to med school, your nurse practitioner went to nursing school, you learn anatomy, physiology, you learn diagnosing, you learn treating. I felt like there was a lot missing there as far as how do we integrate really good nutrition? How do we integrate really good mental health practices? How do we get people to sleep at night? <laughs> how do, you know, and then just integrating all the things that women have been doing for years since time immemorial <laughs> to support their family's health. And so I did a one-year training in integrative and functional medicine for women and now I use that model from a sort of a health coaching type framework where I work from home. I work on with women one-on-one -on -one in managing health issues. So supporting nutrition, supporting lifestyle, making changes in their life to support their health and the health of their family. So I use that one-on-one -on -one model meeting with people like this over Zoom or over the phone really listening to them and giving them the time to get all of their questions and concerns out, making sure they feel heard. I don't feel like that was possible for me in the conventional model in a clinic where you have restrictions put on you by the insurance company, mm -hmm. by the office that you work in saying, okay, you have 15 minutes with each patient, mm -hmm. or you have half an hour with each patient. I can take as long as I want. I'm at home. The initial consults that I do to really do like a deep dive into somebody's health concerns is 90 minutes. I start at birth. I say, what was your mom's health like when you were born? And we work all the way forward and we make a whole timeline and we talk about all of those things, all of those concerns, all the questions, all the random events that you think may or may not be related. We deep dive into all of that to get to the root cause of problems and not just send you home with a Band-Aid solution. So that happened a lot to me as a patient where I go in, I had a problem or I did, you know, I worked in the clinic. This is an ex as an example, we had, I worked in a women's health clinic, just a normal OBGYN office. Woman came in recurring yeast infections. She had been having yeast infections for years and they just kept coming back every couple months. And every couple months they would put her on the same drug. It would go away for a little bit and then it would come back. And so she came in crying, frustrated. Why is this keep happening to me? This is painful. This is annoying. <laughs> this is irritating. I don't feel like we're fixing the problem here. Why would I keep having these infections for years? And why do you keep doing the same thing? And the nurse practitioner who was well-intentioned just gave her a form and said, these are some things that you can try. And then that was the end of the visit. And we walked out of the room and I wanted to go back in that room and just hug that poor woman <laughs> and say, tell me more about your life. Tell me, what are you eating? What are, what's your stress like? What is, what have you tried? What has worked? What hasn't worked? You know, and that takes a lot of time. So now I have the freedom to spend that kind of time with people really trying to get to the root of the problem and not just keep throwing a band-aid solution at it because that is not really solving the problem. So I work with preconception care. So optimizing nutrition mm. and lifestyle and sometimes supplements and whatever's needed and doing additional testing preconception for people who are having trouble getting pregnant. So some 
infertility or subfertility, you know, I've had a baby, but second one, for some reason, it's taking a lot longer to conceive, to try to troubleshoot what's going on because the conventional model has one option for you. And that's to go to the reproductive Mm -hmm. medicine specialist and get IUI or IVF. I feel like that's skipping a whole lot of, (laughs) you know, smaller interventions that will ultimately make your body healthier for pregnancy and make your body healthier for postpartum. So, and also working with women to optimize health in pregnancy and optimize health postpartum. So recovering from the postpartum period, getting their nutrition back on track, you just lose a lot of nutrients <laughs> in the process of growing a baby and optimizing health in that period will make you so much, will set you up for success for future pregnancies. And will also you know, give you the energy and <laughs> the emotional capacity to care for your child. You know, when mom's she, not feeling good, she can't take care of her kids. <laughs> yes. And that is the hugest thing with the self-acceptance piece of the make life fun podcast is that you have to take care of yourself so that you can in turn yes. take care of your children. So everything Absolutely. that you're doing is so needed and necessary. And mm-hmm. I just want to like send you all this love for what you're doing <laughs> to help moms and women. Cause as you're speaking, I am nodding my head. I am getting full body chills. Like, yes, we need <laughs> so needed to fill the gaps that you said that we can't do within 15, 30 minutes at a doctor's office. Absolutely. So thank you for the work that you're doing (laughs) in this beautiful conversation, because it was so beneficial for even me to rehear all these things Mm -hmm. and to kind of relive it in my head as I was going through Mm -hmm. my own journey. And yeah, so I would love to know how our listeners can support you, can encourage you, can work with you. Sure. Um, How do they get in touch? So I am, I have a website and I have an Instagram. So either of those ways, my email information is on my website and they can go to my website and fill out a form and get a free consultation, like a free 15 minute kind of just to like that visit I was telling you about (laughs) earlier. Is this a good fit? Do you have what I need? You know, because if, if it's not a good fit, we're spinning our wheels, but I just love working with everybody so far. I'm like, yes, I can do that. Yes, I can do that because I just want people to feel better. But to make sure it's a good fit for both of us, I do like a 15 minute call just to talk about, you know, what's going on, what, how I can help you. So my website is karenashleynp.com. So K-A-R-I-N-A-S-H-L-E-Y-N-P.com. My Instagram is at karenashleynp. And I actually made a little download for your listeners about it's a little form to kind of fill out before going to a doctor's appointment. And there's also a page in there on questions like just, and it has check boxes too. So some of these questions won't apply to you or something you don't care about, you know, but it's something to think about questions to ask a provider to see if it's a good fit and then a place to write your questions, a place to write your answers. And I'll put that on my website as well so that they can get to that page and then they can connect to the rest of the page from there. Thank you. Thank you. That is so, that could be so helpful having those lists of questions right there. After this beautiful conversation about optimizing health and being your own advocate, do you have anything else on your heart that you, you have the floor that you feel oh. to share? <laughs> <laughs> the main pillars of my, I guess, approach to health in general for ourselves and for our families, the main pillars are nutrition, like eating really well not starving yourself, not being restrictive, not, you know, it's hard. I mean, diets are very popular right now. You know, do this diet for this, do this diet for this. I do have, you know, therapeutic diets for a time, but really eating nourishing food, foods that make you feel good, foods that giving are giving your body good information is huge. The second one is movement, just moving your body. And then the third one is managing sleep and stress, which I think sort of go hand in hand. Those could be different, but I like to approach my day when I'm feeling, when I'm feeling really great or when I'm just feeling really tired and burned out, what is one thing that you can do today to really take care of yourself? And it can be small, drink the recommended amount of water, (laughs) or it can be go on a walk, take the kids outside. One of those things, or I can just go to bed early tonight to choose something from one of those pillars of, you know, nourishing your body with food or moving your body or managing your stress. Well, just pick one. You don't have to change everything in your life right now. It's sometimes you just can't, it's just too much, you know, to make big changes, small changes 
are great. Small, consistent changes are wonderful. So, you know, I'm feeling bad today. I'm going to go on a walk. Like I'm going to do one thing today that is really going, that will help me to care for my body that will be helpful to my body. Oh, so. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, for this beautiful <laughs> conversation, for your wisdom, for your knowledge, for the work that you're doing in this world. And oh, thank you. I'm so happy to have had this conversation with you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for listening to the Make Life Fun Show. I hope you enjoyed yourself and got a little, little gems, little pieces of gold that you are taking to heart, that you are not just listening, but you're going to do something about it. I want you to be fired up. So yes, so we come once a week, come back, listen to us here. We are on all podcasts places you listen. We are also on YouTube. If you like to watch the show at Josie Wheatman, you can find us at Make Life Fun. And I am so stoked. And also come follow me, come play with me on Instagram at Josie Wheatman. I am dancing. I am showing my sweet baby. (laughs) And we're just having a ball. We're making life fun. And so come hang out with us. And thank you again for listening. Please subscribe to the show. Follow us, leave us a review because the more you love up on me, other people can find the show and love up on us. And we build this community that is one of love and goodness. Also, I am taking clients. I'm taking one-on-one coaching clients. Like I said, we're talking about Bloom. We have a membership coming up and all the beautiful things. So there is a few ways that you can connect with me on that. So we have my website, which is backrosecoaching.com. You can go on there as well as you can join the mail list. So right now I have a 21 day raise your vibration challenge going on. It's an email challenge completely offhand. You wake up every day and you get these tidbits of goodness that light you up. So why not? It's a 21 day high vibration challenge. It's tools, it's simple, it doesn't require much. Most of them, if you want a little taste, is placing your hand on your heart and telling yourself you love yourself today. So yes, so come hang out with me, jump into my world. I've got you.